Thank you, Neil. Um, yeah, I'm standing between. I'm the one between uh, you and lunch, so I'll try and um, whisk through this one without uh, losing sight of where we're at. Um, so Shannon introduced genotyping by sequencing, and I must admit that I have a long background, decades in um, genetics, particularly of plants about 10 years of genomics, and I'm standing here talking for the very first time about weevils because I've always been working with plants. And the expert is actually sitting in the audience, so um, if I go wrong, I'm sure he'll pipe up and tell me that um, I should correct what I'm saying. Anyway, the background on Argentine stem weevil. Um, New Zealand pastures are, are and, and products of the pasture, so that's seed for rye, grass, and clover, as well as all the dairy products, are worth more than 18 billion US dollars per annum to the New Zealand economy. And this is statistics in New Zealand 2014. I think this has only gone up since. Um, the, the basis of the, the pastures is rye grass and white clover grown in the mixed sward. And one of the main problems that you see in rye grass is the Argentine stem weevil, which attacks the, the grass. So this is a picture of the Argentine stem weevil. It's tiny. There's a number of specimens there, but it's, it's really, really, really small. And um, so Argentine stem weevil, I call it ASW from here on in, is also called Listronotus bonariensis. It's a major pest, and the, the way it does that is it, um, the larvae do stem mining quite badly, and the, the adults uh, damage the seedlings as they emerge. The pest originates from South America, uh, where it's found natively. Um, the first record in New Zealand is 1927. We don't know really when it arrived, but this is when it was first recorded. It builds up to extremely high numbers, 500 per square metre in Arden pastures, and a study back in 91 estimated that the damage can be up to a quarter of a billion dollars per annum. So some action needed to be taken. And on the back of that, um, um, a Expedition was undertaken to South America where collection was made of a biocontrol agent. It's a parasitic wasp called Macrotonus heparoidae. And it's collected from a wide, wide range of different um, environments in South America. And we'll, let's call these um, ecotypes. So again, this is a very, very tiny insect. And what you see in the picture on the bottom left is the parasitic wasp actually injecting into the, uh, laying an egg into the, into the weevil, and that's how it does its damage. So at Ag Research, and that was Steve Goldson and, and team, they grew these, they reared these parasitic wasps in huge numbers, and about a million of them were released throughout the country. And with hindsight vision, this was, this was actually a brilliant move, but um, at the time what they did is they released all these so-called ecotypes and equal numbers throughout New Zealand. So um, you can see on the map all the, all the sites where it was released, and that was done over a period of about uh, eight to 10 years. So parasitism levels of the weevils that were collected since were quite high. So in 94, a big study was done where you can see in the different regions there of New Zealand, parasitism rates were high, were very, very high, up to 90%. But for some reason that collapsed over the decades that, that followed. And when they went back in 2015, those numbers were, were really, really low and were starting to get to uh, zero to 10 percent in the red regions and 20 to 40 percent in the yellow region in Canterbury. And the problem was we didn't know why. So the, the way we collect these, I say we, I've never ever done this, but the way that these samples were collected was, was with a leaf blower in reverse. So you go up out to the field and you actually do vacuum cleaning basically with a leaf blower. And this picture shows um, Steve Goldson in action with a leaf blower sucking up the insects out of the, out of the grass. And, um, and, and uh, the, the reason I show him here is that he's the nester of the project. He's the, the guy that got it all started, and he's really the expert in the audience. And on your right there, you see how tiny, how very, very small these weevils are. And so what we do to determine the parasitism rates is to um, have these weevils sitting in, the, in these plates and very, very tiny and prep them out and count. 
So um, although there was initial parasitism success, it declined and it was never understood. Well, it just sort of happened and, and that wasn't supposed to happen. It was very successful, so why did it crash to the ground? So went back and looked at um, all these data that were collected over many, many years. 196 sites, 18 regions, thousands and thousands of weevils. Um, so there was historical data, but we, they also went out and got some new data since they discovered that um, the parasitism was crashing. So the graph that you see there is, um, is from left to right, years of, year of sampling. So this is the calendar year. You see that there was this decline of parasitism happening with the odd exception of a few, of a few um, um, samples there. And this is year of sampling. So there was a decline, but there are some exceptions. However, when this data was reanalyzed by year since release, there was actually a, quite a steady line. So the decline is happening with the time since release. You put the parasitite Parasitoid, parasitic wasp out there, and as, as time goes by, the parasitism rate goes from very high and comes down to very low levels again. So this, was, this is quite remarkable, and it's quite a, an interesting finding. So this picture was taken from a study in PNES that was published a few months ago, and it was obviously so remarkable, I'm, I'm not an entomologist, but obviously so remarkable that I've got a commentary in, in PNES accompanying the paper as well. And um, Stephen guarantees me this is not embargoed, but in the next few days there'll be a background story in science about this as well. So it's obviously a very, very important um, finding. So why did this happen? And you can think of various reasons why this would happen. And, um, and, and there's no time to go into all of them, but there is one thought. One thought is um, that we have a very monotonous ecosystem, and that there's no refuge, refugia in the uh, in the pastures in New Zealand. So, without going into the details of this, I'll refer you to a, a talk that Steve's going to uh, give after afternoon tea uh, upstairs today, um, talking about these monotonous ecosystems. And one of the things is that. Peak parasitism in New Zealand reached 80 to 90 percent, while in its native range, with a lot more other things happening in the environment, it never goes above about 25 percent. So the dynamics is very different in the native range compared to these artificial systems that we have in New Zealand. The other question you can ask, and that's the one that I'm trying to address here, is, is, it, is this due to genetic variation? Because what I didn't tell you until now is that the parasitoid actually reproduces partnogenetically, so all its progeny is identical. So the mother produces progeny, it's identical, etc. So there's no evolving, there's no changes happening in the parasitoid, while the weevil can reproduce sexually. So the, 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 the arms race is lopsided. So the initial high parasitism probably puts a lot of pressure on this weevil, put the selection pressure on the weevil to somehow find a mechanism to get away from being attacked from, by this parasitoid. We don't quite understand why that happens, but we, we think that something is, is going on there. So we decided to study the genetic variation within and among the populations of weevils that we collect throughout the country. And um, Shannon has already described genotyping by sequencing and all the advantages and some of the disadvantages that it has. <clears throat> so in case of the weevil, we do not have a genome sequence, we don't have a lot of knowledge, so we decided that this is, this is the best way to tackle the problem. So we generate a large number of markers, we don't have a genome sequence, and it can be used quite universally. So you we can add data later and go back to the initial data set and reanalyze and, and see what, um, whether, whether we have to draw any different conclusions or whether things are changed over time. So we did a pilot study where we went out to four locations and, and collected insects. Uh, and this ordination plot shows you these four populations of insects. So I every data point is an individual insect for which we have done genotyping by sequencing. Uh, up to 24 samples per population, and we didn't look at whether they were parasitized or not. So this is a mix of with and without parasitoid. We um, initially got 51,000 SNPs, but after some filtering, this, this ordination plot is made with 1,900 SNPs. And what is remarkable here is um, that we've got two populations that are, seem to be convergent. 
And these are two populations, Lincoln and Ruakura, so Hamilton Way, um, that are under very high pressure of the parasitoid. So the question now is, does this high selection pressure that these populations see cause con genetic conversion? Convergence. So based on this, we decided to do a bigger study. So we have now insect populations from 12 locations, and they vary, those locations vary with parasitism level. They're either high or low. And so far we've looked, so this is preliminary results that I'm presenting here, we looked at 340 individual insects from seven locations. So initially we find 100,000 SNP markers and after some filtering and, and, and other bits and pieces that we do to, to uh, improve our, uh, the quality of our data, we are looking at 10,000 high quality SNP markers. And so here is the preliminary results that we've got here. 10,000 markers and seven populations that we've looked at so far from different locations throughout the country. And again, you see there's regional um, conversions of these, of these populations. So the bottom left are three populations from the North Island, the top two are West Coast South Island, and the bottom right is Southern South Island, two populations. So again, the question is, is there a selection pressure that is, that is related to the uh, parasitoid presence and absence? So there's two more populations to come, and they are a bit bigger. So the populations I showed you before, these ones are about 50, uh, maximum 50 per population. We're going to look at um, about 96 from Lincoln and Ruakura to add to that. And both of those have high parasitism pressure. Um, and on top of that, we are uh, together with uh, Peter Dearden Group at Otago University under the umbrella of the Bioprotection Centre, CORE, um, looking at the genome sequence of this weevil so that we can actually use more SNP markers than we do currently and also maybe look at genomic regions of interest that might fall out of that study. So the obvious questions to follow this is, is the genetic variation of the Argentine stem weevil that we see in these plots correlated with parasitism levels? It's something that we haven't done as yet. Some of these weevils will be parasitized and so we need to tease that out as well. As I said, this is ongoing work and this was preliminary results. So in those parasitized weevils, is there a certain ecotype that's dominant? So is there a prevalence of certain ecotypes that were released over others? Um, are some more successful? Is there regional differences? And that's all still to be determined. And eventually, in, in an ideal wor world, we'd also like to um, have a genome sequence of the parasitic wasp so we can enhance the data that we have. So finally, I get to the acknowledgement. Some of this work was done um, um, many, many moons ago by uh, Stephen Goldson, who started this, and lots of other people involved that I can't name here. Federico Tomasetti did the, the modeling study with the Years of Decline stuff, and he's an ECMAT um, postdoc fellow with Ag Research. The people in Palmerston North, Siva Ganesh and Rui Riaragui are the, um, are the um, the, the data jugglers that do the bioinformatics and, uh, and the genetic analyses of the data, and uh, Shannon and her team in Invermay who painstakingly chopped heads of weevils and parasitoid wasps and, and do the, the library preparations and the, the sequencing and the GBS work. So with that, I'd like to finish, and thank you for your attention. Thank you. Good. On time. Right. On time. Good. Oh. How many weevils make up? How many weevils make up a population? How many weevils? Do you need yeah. To how long's a piece of string? Yes. Um, th that that's quite a difficult one to to determine, I guess. But what we have done is we've gone out and we've collected as many as we can find. In some of these locations, it's difficult to get 25. In in Lincoln, within I think it was 15 minutes, you got about a thousand. So. Y you, you, take, you take a gamble on having a representative sample, correct. Um, but, you know, how long, is, how long is a piece of string? How long is your budget? How far does your budget go? So maybe, maybe Stephen wants to comment on that. I, I, I can see he's itching to comment. <laughs> Hundreds of years of experience, we've found that about 30 gives us good and reliable and reproducible estimates of parasitism. So a sample of 30 from a, a vicinity seems to do it. 
uh, the population, the seven that I showed, we sampled about, uh, there was 50 from each, 50, five zero, and so the, the, the two Link and Arua Kura that are currently in progress is going to be 96, well, 95, because you have a few other bits and bobs and controls in your lane, but high 90s, yeah. Well, let's hopefully take this one for conversation. Yeah. Uh, I'm just wondering, you're focusing on sort of selection for resistance in the, the wheat. I'm just wondering if what the manufacturer is removing, you might put on parasitoids for the very heavy wheat seasons. So you're almost having selection for non fit parasitoids. Possible. So, um, so the one thing that we haven't done with these, with these uh, populations as yet is to actually check for presence or not of parasitism. So um, some of these weevils that we are analysing will not have parasitoids in them and others will. So that is another um, confounding factor, I guess, but it's something that we need to tease out of these data and that we haven't done yet, quite likely. There, uh, there is other strings, strands of research going on that I didn't have time to discuss. We are, we're looking at, um, um, at searching ability of the of the wasp for the weevil and is there anything that's changing there and is the plant pheno is the plant genotype depending ha having a role in that system as well so there's a lot of other things happening but it's only so much you can say in 15 minutes all right now i'm going to wrap it up you can ask questions over lunch uh, please join with me